What's up, everybody? Welcome to Tesla Fix. Today, we have an interesting episode about the financials of Tesla with all the things happening right now. FSC might be solved right around the corner. And we have, of course, the financial report of Tesla. They, they're going to upload their fin financials. So I have a special person here to discuss these topics. So let's see who it is. Welcome to Tesla Fix. Make sure to subscribe and like this episode. Hello, Matt. Thanks for being on. Uh, I've, I've look, I was looking for for this interview. It, it's, you're very busy, man. It's hard to reach you, but uh, yeah, it, it, it worked out, and I'm very glad you're you're here. So maybe you can tell the audience who maybe don't know you uh, what you do, what's your background, and then we can just jump right into the episode. Yeah, and thanks, Jan, for having me. It's good to be here. I know it probably took a little longer than uh, it, it otherwise should have, but uh, it, it was uh, definitely looking forward to the conversation. So yeah, for those who don't know me, um, my name is Matt Smith, obviously. Uh, I've got a background in finance, but also in the energy space. I spent seven years kind of working for a uh, power producing company in the electricity generation space. So I uh, have something of a maybe unique view on, on Tesla energy as well. Um, but now I'm working for with uh, Bradford Ferguson, who uh, I think a lot of your listeners might know as well, um, who and, and were essentially running Rebellion Air as well as this uh, the, the main firm, Halter Ferguson. So we try to help uh, investors in general and, and people with concentrated Tesla positions in particular um, just kind of navigate through the various ups and downs and try to marry their financial life with you know the realities of owning uh, a concentrated position uh, in Tesla, which can be quite volatile. So That's a very high high level overview of me and my background. Yeah, that sounds uh, awesome. And uh, of course, I I always look out for the re rebellionaire sticker everywhere on on X. It's pretty uh, widespread right now, and the, especially those people that I have contact with as well. Uh, yeah, pretty cool stuff you do. I think the first thing that is maybe interesting or very relevant also for our, our audience right now is of course the Q3 financial report that is about to be dropped sadly this episode <laughs> wasn't scheduled for uh, Thursday or something it's, it would be make much more sense because then the numbers would be out but you made a pretty interesting projection and uh, maybe you can talk about the the numbers that you 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 see here um, and yeah so may, I'm going to pull up the numbers and maybe you can just Talk a little bit about what you, what you think, what we could expect from from uh, the numbers of Tesla. Yeah, sure. So you know, I will say it's getting potentially more difficult to forecast quarter to quarter. You've got so many different fact uh, variables. You know, I, I think going back to the you know Fremont days and and even when Shanghai was ramping, it was relatively easy to kind of say, all right, we kind of know what you know mm -hmm. Tesla did with pricing in this quarter. We know what the volumes are. Um, and so you, it's, it's somewhat easy to kind of multiply across there and, and um, um, come up with with a forecast. But now you've got four different factories, you know, plus the energy side of the business. You know, the credits are always a, a little bit of a question mark. Um, but in particular, I think that trying to figure out what's going to happen to the overall gross margins when you've got, you know, Shanghai shut down for a while with the Model 3 Highland kind of upgrades. And then you've got Berlin and Austin, which are lower margin uh, plants right now because of the ramp. Um, contributing more this quarter, um, and their margins are presumably increasing. But from an overall perspective, you know, if they're a bigger piece of the pie, then that <laughs> that might actually make the margin as a percentage of revenues to decrease a little bit. So it's you know, I've tried like a very detailed model to try to like get all of those those results a little bit more uh, accurately, and um, have like ASPs by region and cost of goods sold by plant, and, and really like. Um, track that kind of stuff in, in detail. And what I found is like when I actually went into that much detail, my my, my results were uh, <laughs> off by a much uh, higher magnitude uh, than when I had a, a more simplified model. So I've, I've gone back to um, just the original model that, that I developed in 2018, I think, just to, to help with my own kind of investment and in, in research process. But yeah, this so this quarter is, you know, interesting for you, you do have these, you know, continued impact of price cuts, particularly mm -hmm. in Model S and the Model X, um, th those were uh, quite large cuts that, that you saw. And, and then uh, there were there were further cuts, uh, I think, on September 1st. So then you've got like a partial period of uh, potentially larger price cuts on, on, on those vehicles. So, you know, seeing how that might roll through is is one piece of the puzzle. Um, but, you know, really, really all anyone can do is, is uh, do their best to kind of get the 
average selling price estimate in there, uh, have a view on, on what's going on with cost of goods sold. So I, I think it's going to be relatively flat in terms of cost of goods sold. You know, you do have some downtime with Model 3 in, in China, mm -hmm. like we spoke about earlier. Uh, but at the same time, you've got um, you, the, the better efficiency out of Berlin and Austin. And you also have, I think, um, decreasing commodity prices, especially lithium. It's really hard to know how much those might roll through, if at all, into any particular quarter, because Tesla does have kind of long-term contracts. So you can't just look at like the spot lithium carbonite pricing in China and say, okay, well, we know that, you know, there's this much lithium in the, in the car and, you know, multiply that through. It just doesn't work that way. So um, the best you can really do is, is to make a, a reasoned guess. And so, you know, that, that's what I've done uh, this quarter. So I, I'm coming up with a, a modest beat, kind of putting it all together. Um, I think 81 cents is my adjusted earnings per share uh, forecast. Um, mm -hmm. and we, maybe we can, if you've got any specific questions, we can go into those. Uh, but this this chart you have here that I, I posted uh, kind of accompanying my um, uh, forecast, uh, it just shows my historical results. So I've been doing this mm -hmm. since before of 2019. And, and back then you can see, um, it was kind of hilarious because in in 2019 and Q3, Tesla actually posted the first you know kind of major um, positive EPS uh, quarter that that they had, um, and that was right in the middle of the Model Three ramp. But if you looked at the analyst estimates at the time, like in Q4, <laughs> analysts were projecting them to like revert back to negative earnings for some reason. <laughs> Just made no sense. I was like, okay, they're going to grow earnings in Q4 higher than they were in Q3. So where's this extra expense going to be that would be that would be dragging, you know, the earnings per share negative. Um, so that that I kind of had a, um, a a different view than the market at that point, which you can see it was pretty accurate uh, in that mm -hmm. first chart. And so ever since I, you know, felt like I had a, a reasonably a, um, good accuracy level and kind of projecting these these figures, at least compared to Wall Street, I've just kind of kept up with it and have, have uh, made these uh, estimates public over time. Is it surprising for you, the the, the numbers that you've um, analyzed here? Um, or was it, I, I totally expected that, or was something special about the numbers that you that you could highlight? Yeah, so so maybe the, the one thing that I, I think... Um, I'm projecting that would be a, a, a potentially meaningful surprise that I haven't seen a lot of other people uh, forecasting is on the energy side of the business. Uh, Tesla discloses on each of their uh, earnings reports what the deployments yep. are for stationary storage. And, and those have been growing at a, at a pretty fast clip. So like in Q4 of, of last year, they did uh, just under 2.5 gigawatts of stationary storage. Um, in Q1, they did uh, 3.5 nine gigawatt hours and then in q2 it actually mm -hmm. decreased a little bit 3.65 gigawatts uh or gigawatt hours um but if you look at the the growth of the revenues the growth of the revenues doesn't actually correlate to the growth in the deployments and i, I believe the reason for that is because there's a lag between when the revenues are recognized for uh the, these are primarily mega packs that, that we're talking about but it also does include you know power walls and, and smaller um, storage mm -hmm. as well um, but if you, if you look at the revenue recognition milestones, you know, there's a percentage of it that's um, essentially uh, recognized at delivery. There's a percentage of it that is recognized um, when the um, product is essentially, you know, placed in service. And there can be a piece of it that is only recognized once the interconnection agreement for the individual project uh, is actually um, like signed off and in place. And that can be a very long kind of milestone. Um, can be, it used to be, you know, roughly a two year process, but at least in the United States recently, it's kind of stretched out to be four, even five years in some cases. So you do have this, this lag uh, from when Tesla's, you know, manufacturing the, um, the mega packs out of the Lathrop factory to when they actually get shipped to the customers to when the revenue starts rolling in. But, um, I think a lot of people are just kind of ignoring the deployments and they're just saying, oh, you know, like last quarter, for example, um, storage or uh, energy revenue was down a little bit. It was essentially flat, but it was actually technically down a little bit sequentially. And so I think a lot of Wall Street analysts are just looking at that and be like, all right, well, let's just assume it's like flat or maybe it grows 5% or something like that. Not not super meaningful. Um, but I, I think that completely ignores um, this you know, backlog of deployed projects, which have revenue, which is not yet recognized. And I think it's, it'd be rather foolish to just not 
uh, take those those uh, deferred revenues uh, into account for your future periods. So mm-hmm. that's something I've taken a, a shot at doing. The kind of numbers that I'm getting in my model are are uh, pretty high. So last year, or last year, last quarter, uh, Tesla did 1.5 billion in energy revenue. Um, I'm projecting that's going to increase to 2.1 billion in Q3. Uh, and mm-hmm. the big change last quarter was that the the margins on the energy side of the business really ramped up. They they essentially doubled to 18.4% uh, gross margin. Um, I, and I think the the main reason for that is you've got the Lathrop Mega Packs replacing, which was um, a big chunk of of the Mega Packs that had been de- um, uh, developed at the Gigafactory Nevada, and so the margin on those mm-hmm. was, was much smaller. Uh, the Lathrop factory is just much more refined. You've got the Mega Pack Two XL, which is an easier to manufacture product. It's a higher dollar value product as well. Um, so they've just got. Um, it, it makes sense that that margin will continue to grow. Uh, and, and I think people forget that Elon also guided for margins of around 25% on the energy side of the business by the end of this year. So if you kind of do the math on on all those things, um, I'm expecting they'll actually post a uh, gross margin on the energy side of the business of about um, $500 million, a little bit over $500 million. And if you think about that annually, that's a $2 billion annual gross margin run rate on the energy side of the business. Meanwhile, if you look at Wall Street, I think for 2025, most of them were expecting about $2 billion in top line <laughs> um, like revenue on the energy side of the business and assuming margins of, I don't know, maybe 5 or 10% because that's the way they, they have been historically. So if they really surprise and, and post margins that are as good as I think they will be, uh, I think that's going to force some people to kind of go back and significantly raise their, their estimates for the energy side of the business, which um, could be a nice catalyst. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, the energy segment is really much underestimated. And I, you've, you've touched on very interesting points, especially with the margins, of course. Uh, I, I really uh, think that's very interesting. Also, the, the ramping of the factories uh, also from the energy side was significant this, this mm-hmm. last uh, half year. Uh, and yeah, it, it's, it's crazy how underestimated it still is. Um, but um, what I wanted to ask you, because you have worked in the energy sector can people really see what what's happening there because um if you look at the energy sector of course it's much bigger than the than the car sector actually so this yeah. means what what does tesla do so differently that that this has so much value for them uh, for for the business and everything i mean um those For me, at least, uh, I find it very interesting. Those Pika plants, for example, that ca- could be replaced uh, by the by the mega packs, of course. And uh, yeah, so so what? Do you, how do you see in the in the energy sector? Um, maybe that people might overlook a little bit why the mega pack is so relevant for people who who are not in yeah. the energy business. So sure. So you know, kind of going back to around 10 years ago, I think is, is roughly when I, I entered the, the energy space. And, you know, at that time, the trend was just, you know, coal plants were becoming uneconomical on their own. And so you had um, coal plants retiring really somewhat consistently over the last, you know, 10 years. And coal plants, by their nature, they don't like to be ramped up and down. So they have a very constant output. And so that's, that's what we call in the power sector, base load power. So, you know, it's essentially always there. It's always going to run. Um, But you are you removed a good chunk of that you know base load power from the grid. Now, when you remove base load power, that increases volatility of prices because you've got a somewhat reliable source of megawatts going into the grid that are no longer going in there on a consistent basis. So, a little bit of, of volatility there, and, and for the most part, for let's just say 2013 through 2018, roughly speaking, most of that you know, uh, reduction in coal was picked up by natural gas. So it would be peaking plants, but actually mostly it's, it's more efficient natural gas plants um, that are actually able to ramp up and down pretty uh, substantially. Um, so, so that, you know, the, the natural gas kind of sector of the electricity generation industry uh, really grew. But then really in the last, you know, five years, so, you know, 2018 to 23, and, and this trend has been going on for a long time, but it was, you know, really small, Uh, up until maybe the last five years, uh, you had renewables really start to to be the the driving um, source of of new generation capacity on the grid. Um, you know, certainly in Germany, Germany actually really led the way, especially on wind, um, and and that really helped to to make the costs cheaper throughout the rest of the world. 
um, as the technology just improved from some of the incentives that, that Germany put in place. So thank you for that and for your, your high price <laughs> that you're paying. <laughs> Um, oh God! Yeah, <laughs> we could we could do a whole separate deep dive on on that issue, but uh, <laughs> with the feed in yeah. and everything that, that Germany went through, it's it's a pretty yeah. interesting topic. And you mentioned brown uh, or, or coal. We have some brown coal plants again uh, back back online. Back because, online, yeah. Because, it's <laughs> yeah, crazy. Kind of crazy. crazy. There's we have some, a crazy mix, but but of course it, it's true that the renewables are still growing and growing and growing. The dependencies also because energy is also a huge chunk. Uh, of conflict uh poly, oh, sure. poly, yeah there's there's national security implications and everything but just, just to kind of yeah. land the, the the point to to get back to what yes, you were sir. originally mm -hmm. asking um so you then you had you know really substantial increase in renewables which of course we all know they're intermittent because the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow and so that also kind of increased volatility of electricity prices um and because electricity is one of the you know only um commodities out there that can't be stored you know if you produce too much oil you can put it in tanks and and you know they've got a lot of storage facilities that you can store you know months of um, oil or um, almost any other commodity steel you can just pile up coal you can pile up but electricity has to be used immediately or you lose it except for you know and then there's a little bit of storage like you know um, pumped storage but that's very there's very few of that if you if you look at the percentage of the overall e electricity consumption that um can be uh, stored in existing facilities, it's quite small. Um, so, so the increase in volatility and then also the increase in wholesale market prices. Uh, so prices, at least uh, in most places of the United States from people I've, I've spoken to, uh, prices on, on wholesale power markets have roughly doubled in the last five years or so. Um, and and the, the volatility of the prices have, have really increased as well. And so with these dynamics, um, um, playing out the way that they have. And with all the forecasts out there, essentially calling for more renewables to be added, um, that creates a very urgent need for um, uh, a large scale of stationary storage, um, which uh, right now, Tesla is really the the only game in town. Now, there, there are some other people that are, um, you know, manufacturing batteries, um, for stationary storage purposes, but frankly, just not at scale, um, it, it, at least outside China. China does have a, a fair amount of, of stationary storage capacity uh, capability, but in most Western markets, um, a lot of the storage players are really in startup mode. They're trying to build factories and they're not profitable yet. And they're certainly not producing anything like uh, Tesla's trying to do at Lathrop, getting to 40 gigawatt hours a year, solely devoted for stationary storage. So what, what's really unique about Tesla is they're ramping up the storage part of the business with a product that's well understood by the market. It's, you know, it's what we call bankable. So banks will, will finance against it because they know the technical performance and uh, specifications. That's a very big deal in terms of project finance. Um, and so Tesla is essentially ramping this up right at the moment when, when the market really needs it. And I think that's what's yep. unique about their, their position. Yeah, totally, and it's it's crazy that that still, um, if you look at some of the Wall Street analysts or also in the in the financial media in the U.S., when you follow some of the shows that are there, um, you realize that many people still think Tesla is a car company, <laughs> and it's oh interesting gosh. that yeah. that this is still uh, so, so so big. And um, yeah, when when do you think people will? turn or Wall Street will 100% realize, wait a second, here's a huge energy segment uh, going on. Uh, yeah. So, so what's your opinion on that? With, with, yeah. Yeah. You, you, it's, it seems to me that Wall Street doesn't like to believe anything that Tesla or Elon says until it shows <laughs> up in the financials. Yeah. So, you know, that's why I think that it could be a somewhat meaningful catalyst this quarter if, if they actually do produce, you know, the, the margins that I'm expecting on, on the energy side of the business. Because, um, like if you do the math on, on what they've announced, it's already really crazy. I mean, one of the things I like to, to um, uh, kind of point to to highlight this is, you know, the, the Gigafactory Nevada that they're, they're talking about expanding to 100 gigawatt hours um, of, of house made cells, which qualify for a credit um, in the United States um, Inflation Reduction Act. Um, it, just the credits alone on 100 gigawatt hours. Um, out of that Giga Nevada plant is worth $4.9 billion per year. And it's like, it's this very simple arithmetic to just say, okay, here's our stated capacity. Here's the amount of the credit, multiply them together, $4.9 billion. But 
nobody on Wall Street seems to be like capable of doing this. Or, you know, they just say, well, you know, we'll, we'll wait and see. And, you know, eventually once they, you know, kind of ramp up, maybe we'll give them a little more credit then. But to me, it's just it's just crazy that you've got such a meaningful you know, kind of source of, of margins and cash flow um, headed Tesla's way. Um, and Wall Street's attitude is just like, yeah, I'll wait and see. Once it actually shows up, then we'll, maybe we'll, we'll give it a little <laughs> valuation credit. <laughs> Um, so we'll, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, do you think it's, it's comparable to, uh, what was happening with Amazon and Sears back then, um, back in the day that, that uh, people thought, ah, they, uh, Amazon can never compete with Sears. And suddenly, yeah, they took over the, the whole market and we all know that, yeah, Sears isn't anymore. So yeah. What, what do you, yeah, do you, I, or, I, I or is it comparable or not? Yeah. I do think it's it's a it's a reasonable comparison, and you know, even before then, it was like you know, they were a, an online bookseller to start with, and people were like, "Well, yeah. like you know, how are they going to compete with Barnes and Noble?" <laughs> you know, and it's just <laughs> it's it's kind of you know laughable and sad in in retrospect, but um, yeah, I, I think we, there are a lot of people on on Wall Street who kind of have this mindset of what an industry is, and Tesla doesn't really fit those conceptions, and, and clearly neither did Amazon. Uh, but you kind of see how well those comparisons lasted. Um, so, yeah, I, I think Tesla really is in a unique position because, you know, Elon thinks about things from a first principles perspective. And, you know, that leads to having an automotive slash energy slash AI company, uh, <laughs> which I think is poised to really generate a whole lot of cash flow. Uh, but you, you you can't put them just in the bucket of an automotive company because you're really missing everything that's going to happen in the future. If you really, if you just simplify it down that much and, and you start comparing them to Ford and GM, that comparison has never made sense. And if you're somebody who's relied on those comparisons uh, to make your investment decisions, you've lost a lot of money over the years. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. And um, talking about the, the competition GM and Ford here, um, do you think that the UAW strikes are going to be factored in somehow, maybe not this quarter, but next quarter or something? Do you th do you see that maybe this is something that um, is, yeah, it was such a pain point for the for the legacy car manufacturers in the US that Tesla will be in comparison more and more attractive to investors uh, who maybe are not invested in Tesla? It, or, it, it's hard to say how this, this will, will pan out, to be mm -hmm. honest. Um, It does seem unavoidable that, you know, the car companies are going to end up paying a little bit more, which is going to squeeze their margins. Um, to me, it's just this, this comp I, I, it almost seems like they're, they're already kind of <laughs> at death's door. Um, I mean, with these, it, it might seem, it might be a little bit premature because, you know, they're, they're not in any imminent risk of, of bankruptcy. Um, but with Tesla's price cuts, um, And, and frankly, just how good the product is compared to anything that um, at a, the comparable price point that the legacy companies are, are pumping out. Um, I don't I really don't know how you compete, um, especially when they're so far behind on like the technology. And if you, if you fast forward a couple of years when Tesla's you know got the Gen 3 platform and it's like partially being assembled with Optimus, <laughs> like what the margin potential of that is at a much lower entry point. Um, Price-wise for customers, I mean, imagine it actually just does uh, retail for twenty-five thousand dollars, and then on top of that, there are government uh, subsidies in, in most parts of the world that'll make the uh, effective cost even lower. And it's just a much better experience from on an ownership perspective. And, and I think we all know that EVs actually last longer than the nice vehicle. So once consumers, you know, kind of do that math, it's like they're going to be undercutting the total cost of ownership by half. I think uh, in the not too distant future. And so I think even if Ford and GM didn't have these kind of labor issues, I don't know how they would survive that. But, you know, they're talking about giving raises of like 30 percent uh, potentially and cutting the like work days. And I think at this moment in time when you've got, you know, technological ramp up that's, that's making, you know, essentially bringing deflation to automotive to the automotive sector. I don't know how you can afford to pay your employees, you know, you know, 20, 30% more and have them work less. That just, the, the math of that's going to be unsustainable. So honestly, I kind of hope I'm, I'm wrong and I'm missing something because I've got mm -hmm. a lot of you know friends that, you know, in, I'm, I'm in the Metro Detroit area here in Michigan. Um, and so there's a lot of people that I know that would be really significantly impacted by this. So it's not something that I, I take any delight in, but 
um, to me, it just seems blatantly obvious that we're, you know, kind of running down the wrong path here. Yeah, and it's interesting if you compare it also with the German uh, legacy OEMs, they are in, I wouldn't say, they are in a special spot in comparison. It's a little bit different here, but um, I mean, VW also, the VW group produces a lot of EVs. Um, if you compare it as well, they are not too far away, but still they are pretty much behind, but um, they they have declining numbers right now and especially in China which is a market they seem not to really or be able to conquer and um, yeah even the CEOs uh, from the China business also from the VW uh, brand said that the roof is on fire to all <laughs> all of the managers so um, yeah there there are a lot of problems as well and I also think that um, VW will shrink and that's also something that on the other end of the pond that I don't want because of course again many people I know work for VW or right. work for Mercedes and all the German brands so I I don't want to see the industry like collapse more or less but it's pretty evident for me at least that yeah it's It's uh, the tides are shifting. Um, electromobility is here. Tesla pioneered this for and and, and uh, like sh uh, shot the EV technology 10 years uh, into the future. And people st or, or the brands still ha have struggled to keep up. And now with the price cuts, it's devastating. And then we have strikes. So uh, everything on top, it's, it's so many factors. And um, one thing that I find very interesting is um, th this this point of almost no return is that when you your your third party suppliers that you have in your supply chain when you start to shift to EVs and the OEMs that or, or the the third party um, manufacturers that produce uh, parts for the internal combustion engine they at one, some point they will say okay. Uh, We're gonna shift our business strategy, like uh, in Germany. Some some companies already did that. Uh, EBM Pops, for example, they make those turbines for the for the uh, cooling systems in the cars, and those turbines. They they just said, okay, we're gonna switch over to to servers now, and and they shifted already um, away from the automotive sector. We have this shadow scenario that that's not pretty much seen. Is that uh, when those third party suppliers go away more or less uh, or, or can't produce for those uh, manufacturers anymore then the service is also a problem because then you have a lot of um, internal combustion engine cars that needs to be serviced and then the switch could be even more accelerated because then there are no parts available anymore so i don't see uh, like it's a very far-fetched scenario but but i just wanted to ask for your opinion on that if you if you see that if if you've heard somebody factor that in or or if this is totally oh, yeah, <laughs> bananas. i, I haven't heard a lot of people <laughs> commenting on that but I, i do think it's it's a really important point i mean the the supply chain for the the you know um oems is is very much kind of you know intertangled or entangled with each other um, you know, when I was doing investment banking early on in my career, we, one of our clients was, a a tier two automotive stamping pro company. And so, you know, they did some products for, you know, like chairs and roof racks and things like that, which you would assume are going to be reasonably safe, but by far their biggest cash cow was like what you call fuel rings. So these, these were the things that kind of hooked up the fuel lines to the gas tank and, and secured it in tightly. And that was like where almost all their profit came from. And you know, fast forward a couple of years, like that's probably not going to be uh, as profitable. And so if they can't continue to kind of generate their cash flows from that one product, which was so profitable, then, you know, how are they going to do the rest of their business? And, and I think a lot of these companies have a decent amount of debt. Um, a lot of them are, are, you know, this manufacturing in general is very capital intensive. And so um, I think why a lot of investors don't like the automotive sector in general is because it's prone to huge swings in volume. But you've got a very high like fixed cost uh, capital base. So you got you know if your if your volume swings low, you basically <laughs> like run the risk of bankruptcy, and and that can be th that risk can really spiral uh, throughout the industry pretty quickly. Um, which is frankly one of the 
kind of reasons cited for the for the bailouts in 2008. So it wouldn't surprise me if, if these companies just get bailed out again <laughs> under this type of scenario, um, like they did in 2008, at least, you know, uh, GM and uh, Chrysler here in the United States. Um, but it's, I, I just question the ca- kind of long term sustainability of, of the kind of current business models where it just it, it strikes me as crazy that these companies used to be very like vertically integrated. I mean, if you think about what Henry Ford actually did at the outset, you know, he wanted to own the entire manufacturing plant uh, or process. He was down in South America trying to secure rubbers for the for the tires. I mean, that's how vertically integrated they were. But if you look at where they are today, most of them outsource their software. Most of them outsource um, all of the different components. The only thing they've really kept in house is the powertrain, which is, you know, an engine, which is going to be irrelevant. So like their only core competency, aside from, you know, design and assembly is powertrain, which is, you know, like completely at risk. So it's, it's rather unfortunate, I think that, um, you know, they're essentially, they've in-house that and now they're, you know, outsourcing, you know, the, the electric drivetrain to, you know, other companies. Um, and, and they're just trying to, you know, rely on expertise of other kind of electronics companies to, uh, do this rather than really taking the time to build up a team to develop motors that are very efficient and you know um, in-house you know, cell manufacturing things like that. So they're just it, it, it's a flawed strategy, and, and I don't know how you, you recover from it when you look at kind of their assets and their liabilities right now. It's it's a tough spot to be in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I also think that this battle is so difficult. Which of the other competitors to Tesla from the US? let's say Ford or, or maybe G- GM. Uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to laugh there, but um, it's it's difficult to, to paint the scenario when, when, when you have the numbers in front in, in, in your mind. Uh, but uh, who do you think has the best chance of surviving? Let's, let's maybe talk mm-hmm. about this. Uh, because... Yeah, it's it's such a tough tough thing, and the more and the more I l- I've also looked into this, uh, the more and more I I feel like yeah, it's it's pretty evident what will happen in the long run. Yeah, yeah sadly. Yeah, so GM I, d- I don't think will make it, um, and, and I think culture is one of the biggest reasons there. Um, I actually spent some time. I did a couple of internships at uh, at GM when I was in college, and it was just you know incredibly bureaucratic and. Um, people just like were very afraid to make decisions on their own because they just, you know, they, they were worried about their boss and their boss's boss and really just trying to kind of climb up the ladder. And um, I, I mean, I could, I could kind of go on for half an hour about all the different kind of culture problems they had. But I think if you follow kind of Mary Barra and, and the, the types of things that she says, and frankly, just look at their product, like their Ultium battery, it's like they're trying to preserve flexibility f- for a car to be powered by both gas and by electricity. And I'm like, okay, well, that's, just a stupid compromise that will make both products worse. Uh, so, I, so I just think their their leadership and their culture is completely down on the wrong path. So I, I really don't think that GM is going to make it. Um, Ford, you know, I, th- I think the thing Ford has going for it is, um, you know, Jim Farley is is a great leader. I think he he gets it. I think he's got a vision of how significant the issues are right now. Um, and I think he's kind of willing to, to lead the ship in the right direction. Um, now, I don't know how you drag a, a, an organization as massive as, as Ford is, you know, kind of down that that um, path to try to compete with Tesla. Like, that just seems like a, a tough proposition. Um, but at least, you know, I think he's trying. So I'd have to give Ford a little bit better odds uh, just for that reason. But, um, you know, I talk to people at both companies and a lot of the suppliers. And I think for the day-to-day workers, um, there doesn't seem to be much of a difference between working at Ford and working at GM. So the difference is mostly on the leadership. And while leadership is is important, you know, it's not the only thing. And, and you still you know, you still got the problems with the UAW. So whether you're Ford or GM, and you know whether you're Mary Barra or Jim Farley, you've still got this problem of how do I get through this UAW negotiation, and how do I try to compete on the other end when I'm already call it five years behind Tesla. So. I don't know how you get around that, but, um, you know, I, I think there are things that Ford could do to at least give them a shot. I mean, w- one of the ideas I've just thrown out there, and this isn't like a save the company sort of thing, but, um, you know, Jim Farley seems kind of more willing to work with uh, Tesla and, you know, seeing, mm-hmm. I think he's got a good rapport with with Elon Musk and um 
So like the the Bronco, the Ford Bronco is like a car that's uh, selling really well and is, is like great stylistically. And I think if you had like a, a Tesla platform, so like the batteries, you know, the the motors and the FSD system and just, you know, Ford said, OK, you're, we're, we'll put like the body on top of that. To me, like that's a car that would sell well. Like, there's just some people who don't want a Tesla for whatever reason, and, and that's fine. And and I think if, if Ford were willing to kind of commit and say, all right, we're going to do some stuff with the Mustang, you know, some of the brands that they have that have a rich history and that have some loyal customers, um, I, I think if they went that route, they they do really well. Same thing um, for Jeep. Like Jeep, I think is a really strong brand that uh, could do really well with some electrification. But that's you know, Chrysler, which is like a whole you know, <laughs> kind of hot mess with, with Stellantis right now. And frankly, they're not really mm-hmm. showing much interest in, in kind of competing on these dimensions. So uh, I, I'm least optimistic about, about uh, you know, Chrysler slash Stellantis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, Jim Farley at least seems uh, reasonable in the interviews he did. He, he acknowledges the problem. We also had somebody in Germany that was on that route, which was Herbert Dees. Herbert Dees. Oh, so- yeah. yeah. He got so He was great. So and when he got kicked out, that was when I lost my confidence in VW. It yes. Was, it was so sad. Me too. Me too. But uh, I also talked with Alex Voigt, who is also an analyst and specialist here in, in Germany, uh, looking at the this topic. And he said that Herbert Dees is a great visionary, but he did a lot of mistakes as well in leadership. Um, that's why uh, it didn't work out. But still... At least he acknowledged the problems. And um, you've mentioned culture or company culture. And also there are so many differences in, in uh, company cultures in the U.S. and Germany as well due to the, the countries or the differences in, in culture of the whole country. And um, yeah, in Germany, you don't step out of line. You, you don't do that. And if, if, you, if you step out of line, you get more or less sort of, which is sad because you have to look at a problem, see the problem, analyze the problem to really get rid of the problem and start working on the problem. But um, Germans take a lot of pride in the success of their own company. That's why they're going to shut everything down. That's not, uh, uh, especially not from the leadership. That's this huge deal. And also VW is so complicated, structured with yeah. with uh, with the Porsche Peach family and uh The Workers' Council, which has a lot of influence as well, which is fine because in Germany that's pretty normal to have a Workers' Mm -hmm. Council, but still there's so many interest conflicts there that, yeah, yeah, and the Porsche P family thought, yeah, okay, Blume is the the right guy because he did great, great things with Porsche, of course, but I think you cannot really block everything Porsche did to the whole VW group. It's, it's, I think that's a little bit more difficult, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, what, what you're getting to is that, you know, there are kind of structural considerations, you know, from from the ownership to the workers councils and, and frankly, just to the, the size of the organization that makes yeah. it very hard to get the whole organization kind of uh, working fast in, in one particular direction. Um, and that's, I think, in, in pretty stark contrast to Tesla, where, you know, essentially whatever Elon says goes. And so if he just says, we're dropping ultrasonic sensors, you know, that change gets made. And then, oh, that was a mistake. Um, you know, or same thing with with radar, you know, just put it back in. Um, you know, but it, you can make these these kind of large decisions uh, very rapidly. Uh, whereas, you know, for, you know, any of these other companies, whether they're in the United States or whether they're in Germany uh, or even Japan, it's like, oh, well, you know, We'll study it for a year or two and then we'll plan which model year it'll go into. And so like you, you just have this this whole different way of, of handling decision making where, you know, management has a say, the engineers have a say, the designers have a say, the manufacturing group has a say. And they all, you know, it's just a, a, a much more um, muddled process that uh, is hard to kind of, um, you know, compete with someone like Elon who can just say what he wants and has it done. And if you couple that with the fact that he's incredibly competent at, at, at assessing some of these decisions and frankly kind of admitting when some of them are mistakes and, and backtracking that's just like that's that's a huge competitive advantage you know it's it goes to pace of innovation which is what he says is, is like their long-term competitive advantage um and and i don't know how you how you compete with that um when, when you've got all these other interests in, in the other companies Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. And I think you've, you've uh, touched on an interesting point before. You said, yeah, it's about culture and you could talk wh- half an hour about culture. <laughs> and But I think this 
since I'm from the design space, I also analyze, of course, uh, culture and how this influences companies uh, because it also boils down to the design and everything, how the the, the claim, the marketing claims are, are uh, uh, out of that. For example, if you just paint your claim on the wall and say, yeah, we're totally uh, like a startup and totally agile, but in reality, your culture isn't at all all that so, so you have to also design the culture so so i'm totally with you and i think this is also such an overlooked point because it's hard to analyze culture and everything that uh, analyze those structures but i think it's very important and i think um what it boils down to if you compare tesla's culture to the rest of the automotive industry it's pretty interesting It just starts with the anti-handbook handbook, in my opinion. If you if you look at the anti-handbook handbook from Tesla, where it says, uh, "Yeah, you have your own head, more or less. Uh, you can you can talk to to different. Uh, uh, if if you can solve a problem, just talk to anybody, even write Elon Musk a mail if it if you have to. So open communication is a big thing. Of course, if you abuse the system, that that might not be uh, a good thing." But also the simplicity. Um, I've compared uh, for my master's thesis the compliance handbook of VW <laughs> to uh, the anti-handbook mm. handbook, which is four pages or three pages long. And it's interesting to see a 25 pages compliance handbook compared to Tesla's anti-handbook handbook. And uh, the overall message from the VW handbook more or less is don't do things on your own. Always ask your su superior and and don't talk to anybody outside of the company about anything and, and stuff like this, which, of course, Tesla has also compliance uh, things you have to sign off, of course. Uh, but uh, I think this is such a big deal because um, people, I think, start to yeah uh, resign in, in their in their workplace when they are not allowed to think on their own because of all the rules they have. And that's why simplifying things uh, that way as well uh, is such an advantage that that really is in the DNA of the company, which really much, uh, yeah, shows the, the success mm -hmm. of the company. What yeah, do you think I, about the... I think you're right. I mean, a lot of companies, you know, feel like, oh, we've you know run into this issue with an employee, so we need to be prescriptive in our procedures about how to avoid that type of thing in the past. Um, where, it, where and a, a lot of companies do that, go that route. They just say, okay, you know, we've had all these types of issues, so we need to go and spell out the, no, you can't do this. No, you can't do this. And, and I think Tesla's approach is more like, Hey, use your common sense. Like, and we, the most important thing is solving issues. And if the only way that you can figure out to solve an issue is to email Elon Musk, then that's fine. Now, I think implicit in that is like, if you're just an idiot and you're emailing Elon Musk, you're going to get fired, right? Like, so it, it cuts both ways. But I think what that encourages is like thoughtful consideration. So like if you, you actually have an idea, obviously, like you don't need a handbook to tell you, like, go to your boss first, you know, say like, hey, I've got this idea. I think this would work. And if for whatever reason, it's just not, you know, we're getting through, but you think it's a really important idea, you know, escalate it. And if you're right, you know, the company's going to have your back. Uh, that's, just seems like very obvious that that's a, good, a better way to, to run the company. But I think what happens in a lot of organizations, especially ones that are, you know, 100 years old is, you know, you, you just get kind of complacent and middle management, you know, kind of carves out their own little uh, kingdoms. And you know, then you've got people who are in charge of handling the compliance workbook and or handbook. And <laughs> yeah, it's just, It's crazy. I mean, I saw this in my job in the energy space, actually. It was kind of hilarious. They had this whole, um, they wanted to essentially like implement a lot of the ideas like with the Toyota production system, you know, into their, mm -hmm. into the company's DNA. And so they were just like, had all these initiatives about, you know, like um, efficiency and like, like standardized processes. And it like it was coming from a really good place. But what happened in practice is just that like all of our meetings would like, waste 10 or 15 minutes going through all these metrics and then we were like we're just like printing off all these papers all the time and like people were spending all these time like generating reports that were supposed to help with decision making but in reality we're just like not particularly impactful <laughs> like at all and so it just like ended up being this like well-intentioned um plan that created zero value and actually destroyed a little bit of value just with all the lost time in meetings and you know people like 
printing out and like spending all these time generating all these reports. And so I just think like that's that's a much more common kind of culture than, than what Tesla has, because what Tesla has invites some chaos because um, there aren't clear rules and you've got different individuals who are going to have different views on things. And um, people, a lot of people, I think, are frankly just uncomfortable to kind of have an argument but not have it be personal to say, like, look, you know, I think this is the best way to run the, this part of the Model 3 line. No, I think this is like a way to actually increase the efficiency. And most people just want to be right. But I think Tesla's got a really great culture where they're saying, I want the process to be right. So this person will back down if he recognizes that the other person is right. Like that's that's real magic in a culture. And um, I, I think that's why Tesla is able to do a lot of the things that they're able to do because people are they're not married to their ideas. They really want the overall plan to, to be what's best. That's why you see like some of the stuff that Franz talks about where he's trying to make the manufacturing as easy as possible while still making the design elegant. Like a lot of designers don't like that. They're just like, no, this, what I've created is beautiful and you must figure out how to manufacture it. It's like, no, that Franz knows that's not how excellent products are made um, that are good for the com company. So I think, but it's it's very rare to have someone like Franz that's you know willing to give so much to the manufacturing side of the equation. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think this is uh, also the one of the biggest advantages of of Tesla in that sense that it's so different um, and so direct almost. Like it's so much on the core problem you have you you uh, and also with with all those automations um happening inside of the company for example that they have uh, I've had Joe Justice on uh, a few times two times here and uh, he also talked about this uh, automation processes that they have on the line that that actually changes the line while you're working at it for example some parts are missing and the systems already recognize that oh okay um they're going to be a shortage soon so the line has to shift now to a different task and then it just shifts this Uh, shift, shifts that and this also means that they gonna get more and more rid of more and more managers because they can automate the stuff and automation gets rid of managers at, at, as well and I think you've touched on a huge point that people get comfortable in their management position and they carve out their little kingdom like you said and um, the human factor in that sense is so bad actually for the whole business if you compare it to that because If you have it automated, then it's fine because the automation won't say anything or, or build their own kingdom, hopefully, <laughs> or, or it's a little bit dystopian. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. You know, and I remember a couple of years ago, I forget exactly when it was, but um, Elon mentioned that uh, there wasn't going to be an FSD update for a while because the, the team was working on software updates for the manufacturing facility. And I was like, wow, you've got like the Tesla software team, which developed like the amazing you know, in-car system and like, you know, a lot of the, the, the stuff with, you know, autonomy, like obviously just like top tier software development uh, capabilities. And, and if you set them loose on a manufacturing problem and say, okay, like we're going to try to make things as, as like optimal as, pro as possible here. Like, I don't really know what that even looks like, but I think, I think you kind of touched on it with um, some of the kind of automatic adjustments of, okay, we're out of a part here. So the system, like a lot of it's software driven, will just, okay, well, here's what needs to happen in that situation. And then, you know, it, it makes the job with the people on the ground as easy as possible as opposed to a lot of the, the lines that are, you know, I, I've toured a lot of the lines for the the other automotive companies. And it's like, if there's just something that stops along the way, the whole line will come to a, to, to a halt. And then everyone's just like scrambling around like, hey, like what's going on with this station? Like, what do we, how, like how can we, and people are like mad more than anything. Um, and, and I think that's just in such stark contrast to, you know, a system that um, can kind of self-diagnose a lot of these problems and keep things running. Um, it's, that's just a huge advantage. Do you also see that uh, Tesla's background, I mean, for me at least, it's like Tesla is a software company at, mm -hmm. at first. Uh, their DNA is pretty much from the Silicon Valley startup uh, uh, software company um, DNA, also with their processes uh, and also with the like those design thinking ideation methods and everything that are so ingrained into software development or design. Um, I think this makes so much sense to to get into engineering as well because then you have those uh yeah th this huge advantage and um do you see that um tesla doing their own refining 
you see that that they also will look at that as a yeah as a test plan to to show the industry how they could improve their own processes uh, in that sense do you think they they're going to make it more intelligent or or uh, how do you see the, the yeah refining? i mean I, i think they're already starting to do that um i mean early on in the company it, how many years was it um where tesla was doing over the air updates and none of the other companies were Like that took, I don't know, seven, yeah. eight years, I think, for, for some companies to start doing over the air updates. And, and frankly, even the, the ones that they're doing are not nearly as um, like high quality as, as the kind of improvements that Tesla is able to bring. I mean, acceleration boost is like maybe my favorite example, um, where it's just they, they can actually make your car faster <laughs> zero to 60 with a software update. That's insane. You know, and there, there was one earlier on that it increased the, the range of the vehicles. Just, oh, here's this an extra 30 miles for free just because we figured out how to better optimize the software. I mean, that kind of stuff is incredible. Um, and, you know, I had a, a software update for my, I had a Chevy Volt before I bought a, um, a Tesla and I had to go in for a software update to the dealer. I'm like, that's insane. Like <laughs> send me a USB stick or something like this is just wild. Um, it was, it's, but like Tesla, like, It's part of it is on the, the software side, but a big chunk of it's also on um, hardware. I mean, the, the stuff that they're doing, like with casting, um, getting that done, um, and, and now like people thought that was crazy, and now the industry is really moving that way. Um, and I think it, we'll probably see the same thing on on the Gen 3 platform as well, where um, you know the, the way that they're really tearing apart the entire kind of assembly line process and saying, here's how we can kind of. Um, better optimize for you know manufacturing in, in these different you know kind of cells and then packaging the whole piece together. Um, I think nobody's going to try that off the bat, but I think once they see that Tesla's done it, then they'll say, okay, we'll, we'll mm -hmm. try it now. But then they'll always be you know five years behind Tesla because you know they're, they're it's taking them that long to you know follow them into giga castings and um, software updates and, and a lot of the other pieces. Yeah, it's it's such a puzzle of of different aspects and things um, that are in place at Tesla that that's so different I think to to other manufacturers and especially they don't have this big problem of shifting from internal combustion engines like for example BMW their whole brand is inside of the internal combustion engine with the sportiness the 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 way the car drives uh, uh, it's the ultimate driving machine like BMW claims yeah. their their marketing claims and uh, that's why it's so difficult for them to shift because uh, Mercedes is kind of a different story more or less they they can shift easier I think because they they're gonna uh, Yeah, do do it with with luxury and and light effects and everything and yeah, yeah. St stuff like that. I I don't really like it. It looks like a gaming PC. All the concepts for me like a, a gaming PC. But there's a, like a market for something. that, and it's relatively easy <laughs> yeah, yeah, to have that same type of experience, which would frankly yeah. contrast with what Tesla does. But with yeah. BMW, it's like you've got a the, yeah. you've got like a, a centuries Absolutely. worth of like fine tuning the internal combustion engine and the yeah. suspension and like all these pieces and. Like, I, I, that just doesn't translate as easily. <laughs> Absolutely. And and I also think that, um, that that's how, what you see. And also with uh, Porsche, which is also in the more in the performance sector, they don't kind of really want to go because they love their Porsche sound and everything, of course. So that's why Bloom is also more for e-fuels and uh, for... Yeah, d different yeah. Uh, uh, technologies in that sense, and also tries to push the narrative that okay, yeah, e fuels is great, please uh, everybody, and also BMW. I mean, they decided that they want to uh, roll out like or fifty percent of the fleet they want to have uh, as electric or electrified in two thousand thirty five or something, in, or or maybe two thousand thirty. I think it was, but we have a. We have a stop of uh, uh, selling internal combustion engine in Europe, which is by law now, and uh, when uh, 2035 hits. So uh, let's see how the lobby groups in Germany will try to uh, shift the, the law a little bit or get exemptions here and there. But I think it's a battle that, that they already kind of lost in that sense, and they should shift and BMW goes with that strategy with having three different types of engines. You can have the car with as a hybrid, as, as an electric uh, car and also as an internal combustion engine car uh, or a diesel, which 
is crazy because then you won't have a frunk and everything like the the convenience it's not a designed electric car and it's so sad because BMW did great jobs uh, designing electric cars before even Tesla really was uh, going strong. So so they had something there, but didn't really follow through. And now you kind of see that. And yeah, it's it's crazy how how big of a deal it is that they have to shift from from the from their business because they have those two business sides, and uh, it's hard for them to navigate to that because you have to really go all in more or less. And what do you think um, the best strategy is for companies to shift? Um, do we have examples where you say, okay, this company did it pretty well, um, or maybe even the startups um, that we see left and right? Um, do, what do you think is the best strategy um, to yeah. go electric? I, yeah, I think it, it it's tough because like, I think the best strategy is what Tesla did, you know, be early and basically start with a low volume, high price, and then kind of work down. Anybody who wants to follow that same playbook today, like has to compete with Tesla. And so that's why I think you look at what Lucid's doing and it's like, well, that strategy is clearly not going to work. So you've got a less like per performant product at a higher price. Um, so it's just the, the, the same playbook that Tesla followed just won't work anymore. Um, so, you know, Rivian seems like they're maybe best poised to have a shot. Um, I think they've got their own set of issues, to be honest. I, th I think they made the, those cars way more complex than they needed to. And that's, you know, resulted in, in their gross margins being uh, extremely negative. Um, where I think I'm a little bit more optimistic for them. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they kind of build themselves like this outdoorsy brand, kind of similar to like a Jeep in some ways, which, which I think is, is reasonably smart. Um, but I, I don't think that's ever going to be large kind of mass market type of, of product uh, where I'm more optimistic for them is on, you know, their delivery van kind of segment. Um, I think that's going to be a really smart uh, idea because there's there's a huge market for that. And uh, frankly, it's, it's a segment that nobody else is really addressing right now. So um, I think um, they may be successful just on the on the back of that product. And, and frankly, like their, their cars are great. So if they can figure out how to get their, their costs lower, uh, I think they'll they'll do really well. Um, but they've got they got a lot of work to do on the manufacturing side to really get their uh, their cost structure in order. Um, it, on the more traditional companies, you know, I think what Ford did was really smart in that it broke out the EV business separately. Um, I, I think that creates a lot of incentives for um, that part of the business to really control the costs, and then it also places the company in a position where, let's say, you know, eventually, you know, the ice business does go bankrupt. At least you've got this one you know, kind of remnant that you could spin out and um, potentially continue going. Um, and the reporting structures and everything being separate, I think, is, is a really smart move to um, both keep them accountable to, to really drive out costs, but also to uh, potentially have a vehicle that, that would be really easy to spin out if, if, the, if the parent company does go bankrupt. So um, Ford, I, I like, Rivian, I like, and uh, I think a lot of the others have a, a lot of work to do to kind of show that they can make it. And then you've got Toyota off doing whatever it's doing and saying like hydrogen is the future. And I'm just like, okay, good luck with that. <laughs> or they're, they're of course, uh, haven't you heard about the last uh, five battery breakthroughs they had? Oh my gosh. They oh yeah. The I don't know what it is now, Please, like Matt. solid state or whatever. It's just, I, I, I'm so sick of seeing press releases from, from Toyota. And frankly, it's, it's sad because they had such a, a commanding position uh, on the environmental front and on the battery technology front with the Prius. I mean, that was an absolute Absolutely. hit of a car. And instead of kind of saying, okay, well, the next step would be to, you know, to kind of go all electric and let's like really build up our in-house expertise. They just like let it sit there and eventually it just became like this sad <laughs> reminder of the 1990s to us. And it's just like, oh gosh, it's, it's really too bad because that was, I mean, they, they, they were in a great position and they just let it go. Yeah, they should have just uh, optimized the Prius more and more to get more and more batteries inside, more and more yeah. or uh, more efficient uh, engine, and then afterwards uh, take out the internal combustion engine completely and just have an EV. They could be like right next to Tesla, maybe with their production volumes and everything. I yeah, mean, it's, absolutely. I mean, they they have huge advantages. Yeah, absolutely. And since Toyota, especially in manufacturing, they I mean, they really much like were the ones who made Scrum possible, the, the, the way to, to yeah. organize and structure. So Toyota was so 
far ahead in the 80s and everything and now now you see that it starts more and more to crumble they they kind of missed missed the shot and now the in industry is just shifting yeah it's absolutely crazy and um one thing i wanted to add a company that i think also did it great which is volvo um with polestar for yeah example. i agree they, that's a great call but but of course they're 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 owned by geely now um since like i think 13 13 years and um that's of course the, a big advantage of course because they mm -hmm. they know how to they produce in china and everything and but the design is from from uh Sw sweden and um i think it's a great great idea to how they did it because they broke it out uh from from volvo so so they don't uh, uh frighten their average customer but um Yeah, now now we see Mercedes, for example, partnering with Geely, which uh, I find is yeah sad, <laughs> more or less. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, if if you told somebody some German ten years ago that that would be the case, I, I'm sure that would probably be like they'd be laughing. They'd be like, "No, no Mercedes way. wouldn't do that. No, like we'll be showing them how to do things." It's it's just it's too bad that you know. I mean, the, the German engineering is so so well renowned, yeah. and I think if that was Uh, unleashed a decade earlier on on the the problems of, of EVs and battery manufacturing. I think mm -hmm. there'd be some really interesting innovations and uh, kind of know how that that Germany is is very well capable. I think of leading on this front. And um, but I, I think that a lot of the co companies just didn't take Tesla and, and this you know, kind of new technology seriously. Mm, absolutely. So, Matt, for the end of the episode, uh, I wanted to ask you one last question, and that's. Um, how do you see the future unfold now for Tesla? And uh, maybe you can project a little bit more into the future. Uh, how do you see this will develop? Um, what are the biggest problems that Tesla could have fa uh, could face, or um, is it just smooth sailing from here? Um, with maybe a hint a little bit with FSD on the horizon and everything. I mean, uh, there's a lot yeah. going on there. But uh, yeah, how how do you see it? Will we have FSD next year <laughs> or this year? <laughs> Yeah, so so I think we'll have we'll have V12 next year. I, I think for sure. I, I think the question is, um, at what point is it actually you know like robo taxi capable, or, or even if it's just you know level three or level four or something like that, where you can not be paying attention part of the time. That that'd be a really big milestone. Um, will we get that next year? I, I would say yes. Maybe toward the end of of next year, we'll have some kind of like limited capability where you can take your eyes off the road. Maybe it just starts on highways, um, some, something like that. But um, that alone, I think, would be a, a pretty big milestone. Um, in terms of smooth sailing from here, I, I don't think so. I mean, we've had just a, a kind of nonstop series of, of price cuts. Um, and if Tesla is going to grow their volumes by 50% again next year, I don't know how you do that without, you know, kind of some some more meaningful price cuts. So it wouldn't surprise me if, if we have that on on the horizon and, and that might create more margin pressure and we could have a little bit of a, a rocky period. But whenever we, we kind of get over this hump of, you know, macroeconomic concerns and high interest rates, you know, which which makes cars less affordable, I, I think at some point Tesla will have solved autonomy in the the I don't think a lot of people realize what a big deal it will be once they do that. I mean, you mentioned the um, kind of problem of not being able to service ICE vehicles down the road. Um, but I've been doing some math. And essentially, if you have an autonomous vehicle that's an EV and you look at what's the marginal cost to drive the EV, you know, um, autonomously, it's going to undercut the marginal cost of driving a gas vehicle. And so... I think if you think through logically, what are the implications of you can summon a robo taxi more cheaply at some point in the future, once there's you know saturation and enough of these out there, but call it five, 10 years from now, it doesn't really matter. At some point, there's going to be this inflection point where it will be cheaper to have a robo taxi come and take you where you need to go than to just drive your car, your gas car to that same plot spot. Even if you owned your car outright, it would still be more expensive just because, you know, you're, you're paying roughly 65 cents a mile or something like that on like your all in costs. And if you assume maybe half of that or, or so is, is for gas, it's like the EV is going to cut on the, the marginal cost of the EV is going to be lower than or the total cost of the EV will be lower than the marginal cost of driving a gas car. And that will, I think, be the inflection point where all of a sudden you see gas like 
we're going to see ICE vehicle sales kind of decline. But when you get to that point, it's like nobody would buy one anymore. You'll just have like a bunch of used ones that people are offering at fire sale prices because, you know, it, autonomy is just going to be cheaper. So so that's, I think, the the real major inflection point that's that's going to happen at some point. Now, it, it's several years away, I think, from 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 that. So you've got to solve autonomy first, and that's going to take a lot of time for there, there to be enough vehicles in the space where the pricing gets that low. Uh, but eventually that's where we're going. And so I, I think that's going to be a good thing for, you know, the economies in general, because it's like going to be a deflationary force. So you're going to get better functionality at a lower price and it's going to be, you know, green. It won't be polluting. That's you know obviously very good. Um, so I'm really excited for that future. Um, but then the, just how quickly Tesla's AI capabilities are increasing. Um, like Autonomy is such a huge game changer for Tesla in terms of the value of the stock and, and where the company is going. But Optimus is even bigger and that's like hard to wrap your head around, but um, you, you got these two really massive catalysts and, and they're somewhat binary, like Tesla either solves them or they don't. Um, so that's why I think Wall Street doesn't really give them credit, but um, I, I think it stands to reason that, that Tesla will solve both of them and the, the kind of implications of that are, are really massive and, and mind blowing. So. Uh, putting it all together, I think we may have a bumpy year or two, um, but eventually, you know, the, the technology that Tesla is deploying um, is going to be so valuable that, you know, I, I think we're going to make up for it on the back end. Um, not investment advice, and it, it could very well be, you know, smooth sailing. Um, you know, the launch of the Cybertruck, I think, is going to be uh, really interesting to see if that really um, creates a lot of like social buzz that gets people looking at a Model 3 and a Model Y and, and things like that. Um, but you know, eventually, if you're a long-term shareholder, I think there's a lot to be very excited about. Yeah, yeah. I also agree with that. Uh, but the Cybertruck is only good news if the Cybertruck will come to Germany. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> only, because I pre-ordered one. I'm still hopeful. But uh, also, uh, Matthew Donegan Ryan, who I had on as well, said uh, or his sources uh, stated, yeah, it's it might be first in China before it's uh, here in, in Europe. But uh, let's see, let's see how it how it goes. Um, but yeah, I also agree that Tesla is on a on a yeah cr crazy t trajectory still. And uh, if you like leave out parts of the business like energy, like Tesla bought, like FSD. It's still interesting that the company performs this well. And um, yeah, again, no no financial advice, of course. Uh, but yeah, I, I also think it's a bright, interesting future, especially how the market will shift. And I think one thing I want to highlight still is that um, you've mentioned a, a, a scenario where FSD is uh, available and everything and the cost is much lower than than uh, ICE car to own especially or even an EV from a competitor. So um, this means that for me, at least the secondary market we, will even crash more when you consider that the third party manufacturers won't supply uh, spare parts anymore, maybe. And then yeah. it will f fall apart at some point. It they, they could, could be a very hard hit. I hope it's going to be more smooth than that. And uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I hope uh, we won't see as many bailouts as uh, 2008. Uh, so <laughs> let's see how it's unfolding. But Matt, thank you very much for being on. I think uh, it was such a valuable episode for for looking at the company and um, having a like brighter view, a, a bigger picture on on the company, which is very important. I think. So um, thanks, Matt. For for the end of the show, maybe you want to uh, plug something or something you're working on. Maybe um, you want to share with my audience or where they can find you and everything. So uh, here's your spotlight and then we're going <laughs> to... Sure, and, and thanks for having me on, Jan. It was a great conversation. Um, so yeah, for um, anyone who does have a concentrated position in Tesla, that's a lot of what we do at, at Rebellion Air is, um, you know, people who have a concentrated position still need financial advice, still need a financial plan, and a lot of financial advisors simply won't work with you if you've got a portfolio that's 50% or more <laughs> Tesla. So, you know, we've we had so many clients come to us and say they were either like laughed out of the office of advisors <laughs> they went to or said like, we just frankly won't work with you unless you diversify. Um, and But these people have you know, conviction that they've built up from doing this analysis themselves for years. And so um, for, for anyone who uh, is, is looking for a financial advisor that uh, is willing to work with uh, concentrated clients who have concentrated positions, uh, you can check us out on rebellionaire.com. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, X, <laughs> it's at, at 
uh, M A T C H A S M. Matt, it's a terrible handle, but that's <laughs> that, that's what I've got. So, um, but no, it was a great conversation, and, and thanks for having me on. Thank you very much, uh, Matt. And we got to repeat this at some point. Everybody, there's only one last thing to say now, and that's goodbye, everybody. Wasn't this episode awesome? Let's accelerate the pace of innovation by subscribing to Tesla Fix. It is my absolute favorite channel on the whole interwebs. <laughs>